all, welcome to the Empowering Equine Podcast, where we talk about all things related to science-based training and management, positive reinforcement, Lima-focused training, and equine welfare and ethics. I'm your host, Alda van Niekerk. I'm joined by my husband as our moderator. Hope you enjoy this podcast and find inspiration to become the best horse person you can be for your horse. Welcome back, everybody. How's everybody been doing? Husband? Yeah, yeah we've, we've been bit quite busy. It's the start of our harvesting season. Our first load, is that what you call Shipment. it? Shipment. Shipment, sorry. Shipment. Was loaded onto a truck and it's headed for the US of A. Yes. Go New York. Go New York. It's on the... Now we shall... East Coast. Yes. Sorry, I had to figure out my geography there for a minute. And the second shipment is packed and almost ready for inspection. And the third one is almost packed. So, yeah, we're, we're heading to you. Strong head, uh, headwind. <laughs> well, headwind because everything breaks. Yes, it's it's been hectic. It's been a, a long week. Yes, it's been a long week. Everything has broken since we started the forklifts the elevators most of the equipment has broken at least once this week and to top it all off my dad now has COVID, so i am doing two people's job so it's just just a bit busy but we're yeah we're back at behind the microphones yeah and we're here with you for episode four and we would just like to say thank you so much for the amazing reception and all the kind words and kind comments and listening and everything. It's really, it's nice. Thank you so much for, for the support. We really appreciate it and all we, the kind we words. Do. We both do. So, so yeah, what, what's the topic of today's episode? So, this is actually inspired by, a, it's almost... About a year ago. But let's start with the title. The title of today's episode, oh goodness, I can't speak, sorry, is Turn Out Your Horses. Capital Turnout. Capital, Capital Horses. Yes. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. About exclamation. 11. Exclamation mark. <laughs> I will be going into a bit more detail on why I'm so passionate about this topic. But first, we're going to be doing some theory based on a case study. So, yes, what inspired you for this post? Yes, about a year ago, it has come to light that some top level professionals deny their horses access to turnout. On the grounds that horses run themselves into injuries. I'm sure some of you might remember, but I will be withholding the person's name. She explained to Horse and Hound magazine that she does not turn her horses out. as She does not trust them not to injure themselves. And that was a quote. And of course, this caused a massive social media uproar and rightfully so. In my opinion, this person went on to explain they, and I quote, they probably get out more than an average horse who spends a couple of hours in a paddock. The quote continues, they go on the walker or the treadmill, back in the box for a bit, then I'll ride and I'm not just riding in tiny circles all the time, they go in the arena, in the fields, the woods, the racetrack, along the canal, they're ex- Exercise varies tremendously. They do tons of different things, then go back and have lunch, then maybe the treadmill, then get hand grazed for an hour at a time. The quote continues, (laughs) sorry, they have so much time out of their stables. Of course, horses shouldn't be locked up 23 hours a day. Everyone agrees they should get out of their boxes as much as possible, but there's always a gray area in how the world functions. I've got the resources and facilities to give my horses as much outside time as possible. Yo, I just just got... A flashback from my Boy Scout days 
when we also had that rigorous schedule each day. Yeah, that sounds quite like I was at at boarding school, and I loved it. I mean, it's not like what you see on on the movies, but I mean, there was a strict schedule. But before we continue, I would like to explain that this is not a bashing episode. <laughs> I would like to use this particular event as a jumping off point. So please, I promise I'm not turning this podcast into a hate page. My intent is to never make anyone feel shamed or anything like that. We are purely looking at this claim, argument, standpoint, whatever you would like to call it. As is, I'm not attacking the person. I'm using this as a case study to educate. And I will be adding all my references in the show notes down below. And believe me, there's a lot of them. There's a lot. Enjoy your reading, guys. (laughs) Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's dissect the statement. First, let's hear what science has to say about the statement that horses get injured when turned out. A study conducted in 2006 found that horses turned out for two hours a week were more likely than horses turned out for 12 hours a, a week to trot, canter, and buck. Frequency of trotting and cantering was also higher and frequency of grazing lower in horses turned out for only two hours a week. Two hours a week. Yeah, so actually the lack of turnout is the reason for injuries during turnout, which shouldn't, in my opinion, be an excuse anyway. Twelve hours a week, even, I feel isn't enough turnout. No, that's not even two hours a day. Yeah. Also, especially when we take into consideration that feral horses typically roam in stable social groups over large grazing territories, spending 16 to 20 hours per day foraging on mid to poor quality roughage. In contrast, today's elite show horses live in relatively small stalls eat a limited but rich diet at specific feedings, and typically live in social isolation. This is from Henderson, 2007. It doesn't help that the horse's diet, uh, that a horse's dietary needs are met, nutritionally speaking, but they don't have that chewing through the day, keeping them busy, keeping their minds busy. It's, it's almost a mental torture to give them a little food a day, a, a little bite a day, but all their nutritional uh, needs are met, but their mental needs aren't met. If I had to compare it, I would say that it is, so, uh, if you had to drink two or three or five pills and you have everything you need for the day, most of us would still snack. Most of us would still snack throughout the day if we had five pills that could give us all our nutritional needs. So it is the the act of eating that is uh, important, not the nutritional part of it. Yes, and I mean, 16 to 20 hours a day, horses are built, designed. Their, Their health depends on eating that long. Keeping their minds active, where to walk, where to find this grass oh i'm 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 craving this type of grass i have to walk here and over this yes exactly uh, thing it's and then through this water to get to that yes exactly it's that explorative behaviors and we will get into stereotypical behaviors just in in a second but if you look at stereotypical behaviors a lot of them are associated with boredom not boredom, but you know, it's stall walking, it's crib biting. What is crib biting? It is oral stimulation. What is box walking? It is wanting to move. Explorative stimulation. They want to explore, they want to walk, they want to graze. So these stereotypical behaviors occur because that basic need, that basic desire how horses are built is being deprived and but getting back on point we're getting to that but getting back on point and in my opinion hand grazing and exercise is not is not a substitute for providing a horse with turnout in a social group i'm sorry these social interactions and turnout are important to horse welfare 
And due to a lack of social interaction, horses seem to act abnormally towards each other by acting aggressively, but suggests to be a side effect of lack of turnout and social interaction. When kept in social groups, horses were generally more active, spending less time standing passively, exploring their environment less and eating more grass than in individual paddocks. Based on the negligible amounts of aggression of aggressive interactions and the presence of non-aggressive social behaviors like allo grooming, turnout in social groups appears to be a good alternative in individual paddocks. So this is an excerpt from Jorgensen, if I said that correctly. Get ready for a lot of weird pronunciations, but all these will be linked um, in the show notes. Yes, and we have practiced before on our pronunciation of these surnames. Yes. So, this is actually really interesting. Let's say the horses are hand grazed together and it gets and gets to interact with each other. Is that still not enough, so to speak? Well, for me because it's a important part of my training specifically and Providing my horse with turnout in a social group is a major part of my antecedent arrangements outside of training. By that I mean my horse's basic needs are met. Forage, friends and freedom. In this setup explained where the horses are being hand grazed and on a treadmill and being exercised. A major lacking element is freedom. The horses are not allowed to express their natural behavior. They are constantly being directed, cued, and corrected. And this might not be the case, but to be honest and blunt, I doubt the handlers run alongside the horses when the horses want to have a run and stretch their legs. In short, we should allow sufficient space turnout and companionship, thus allowing the horse to express normal behavior without human interruptions. Are there any other side effects of stalling horses for too long? Yes. Having horses stalled has many health and well-being risks associated to it. Horses show much less stress when not being stalled. A study revealed that a possibility of turnout into paddocks reduced heart rate in racehorses in comparison to horses trained at a racetrack setting. So a racetrack setting would often involve horses being stalled constantly, basically. And another study showed that first-time stabling of horses elicited marked behavioral responses indicative of stress that were not reflected in increased heart rates or salivary cortisol. Another study conducted by Ruet et al. says that the longer horses spent in individual boxes, the more likely they were to express unresponsiveness to the environment. Another way of saying that is they went into a state of learned helplessness. What is learned helplessness again? Learned helplessness is a mental state in which individuals have learned that No matter what they do, they can't stop or control the bad things that happen to them. They tend to give up the fight, so to speak, and they learn to not care about pain or pressure or deprivation or any other negative event because they can't reverse it or they can't do anything about it. Another side effect of stalling, and we said we we would get back to that, is stereotypical behavior. Stereotypical behaviors in horses have been directly linked to stalling. Many stabled horses perform a variety of repetitive behaviors such as weaving, that's wanting to move, stall walking, once again wanting to move, cribbing, once again that oral stimulation they are desiring, head shaking and pawing. This is from Camargo 2014 Lucher et al. 2010. There are strong suggestions that equine stereotypes are connected to poor welfare and a suboptimal 
management, and or stabling environment. Different forms of equine stereotypic behaviours have been described. Crib biting, weaving, and box walking are considered the most prevalent. This is from, oh my goodness, I can't say this. Mm. Sarafchi. Sarafchi and Blockhase. Blockhase. 2013. I'm saying block is just how it would sound in Afrikaans. Yes, in Afrikaans, it's literally a square house. Yeah, block ice. I remember, getting back to our topic, I remember doing a equine behavior course and the way the lecturer described stereotypic behaviors was as a disease of domestication. This was very striking and it really reiterates the fact that we have done this to the horse. Horses in a feral setting do not display stereotypic behaviors. If you want to learn more about equine ethology and the natural behavior of horses, I highly recommend the book Horses and Company by Lucy Reese. I will link that in the show notes as well for anyone interested in learning more about equine ethology. But is there a difference then between equine behavior and equine ethology ethology is the scientific study of animal behavior more specifically ethology is the study of animals in their natural habitat and the emphasis here is on the natural habitat another way of saying it it is the study of natural behavior while equine behavior is more the study of the horse's behavior regardless of setting. So we can look at equine pain behaviors. We can look at equine abnormal behaviors. So it's more like a all fingers or thumbs. Uh, all thumbs or fingers, but not all fingers or thumbs. Kind of. So I had trouble finding a universal definition for equine behavior because it kind of loops you back to equine ethology. So I just want to disclose that I was trying to find a universal definition that everybody understood, but I couldn't find that because it kind of reverts you back to ethology. But, you know, equine pain behavior, yeah, you know what I mean? Ab abnormal behavior isn't ethology. You understand what I'm trying to say, right? Does yes. that make sense? It makes it makes a whole lot of sense. Okay, I hope so. We we have never kept our horses in stalls, or yeah, you know, it's not really a thing with us. But why do people still stall their horses despite all the negative effects? Well, based on my own experience, it's purely out of convenience for the human. That is the long and the short of it. Horse owners will often justify keeping horses in stalls with statements like, you know, they get better quality food than we do, or they live in a lap of luxury. This is once again a perfect example of anthropomorphism, giving a non-human human traits. I always say welfare is much more than a shiny coat, a good body score and the absence of visible physical injuries. Horses are made to move and graze constantly in a group of other horses. So social isolation is so bad for horses. If any social animal, any animal, okay, a social animal like a tiger won't mind being isolated. But I mean, they will at some point desire to go into mating season and... They want to find a mate. Well, in the United Nations, they consider solitary confinement of prisoners exceeding 15 days to be torture. Yeah, that's... And I mean, if you look at horses that are supposed to be in fixed social groups of definitely more than free horses, much more than free horses in some in most cases. Horse, some horses are kept their entire lives in so in social isolation, especially stallions, which is very sad. I mean, they also have the same needs as mares or geldings. So I would like to hammer a bit on social isolation and the negative impact it has on horses. And also in my experience, uh, s stallions that have grown up between mares and foals uh, and all that, 
uh, social in a social group in a social group they are more well behaved if you in quotation marks they have proper social skills they are well socialized yeah they they are, they have better social skills than other typical stallions that are kept away from not me. even just stallions i mean any horse that has I, I will be getting into to that i'm getting ahead of myself a bit so hartman and killing explains that and i quote many horses are still kept singly with limited or no physical contact to other horses this is surprising given the fact the fact that keeping horses in group groups is recognized best to fulfill their physical and behavioral needs especially their need for social contact with conspecifics i hope i said that that correctly sorry as well as to have a beneficial effect on horse human interactions during training domestic horses are faced with social challenges throughout their lives due to limitations in social contact space restrictions and frequent changes in social companionship This is in contrast to natural conditions where horses live in relatively stable harem bands. This is from Christensen and Halleco. Halleco? Halleco? Halleco. Halleco. 2011. And furthermore, a study conducted by Christensen and Malm Malmqvist. Yo, a Swedish Sorry. Uh, listeners must... Or Scandi. Oh, oh, yeah. Is this Scandinavian? I don't know. It, I don't it, know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Eastern European... Yeah, that type... Oh, I, I, yeah. have, I have no idea. Apologies. Great, great apologies. Okay. Christensen and Malmqvist, 2002, concluded that two-year-old domestic stallions are sensitive to social deprivation and... and that stabling has long-term effects lasting 6 weeks at least on the social behavior in stallions even during training singly housed horses bit the trainer more frequently than did group housed horses the response of group groups of free housed horses to training clearly demonstrate the benefits of raising young horses in groups this is from sondergaard and ladewig 2004 another study another study another study found that horses actually are able to learn from one another this is one of the this is actually a benefit from keeping horses in groups after the introduction of adults Young horses expressed new behaviors. Preferential social associations emerged, positive social behaviors increased, and agnostic interactions decreased. And this is from Bjorjade et al. 2008. Sorry if I once again butchered that surname. That to me is so amazing and makes so much sense. For feral horses... This is so important. Young horses need to be able to learn from older horses and more experienced horses or else they won't survive. Horses are biologically built to be with their own kind in groups. Did you hear about the social study they did with monkeys uh, and the ladder and the apples and spraying the monkeys? I don't know what the, they call it, but did you hear about that study? I have. I actually have it's it's very interesting the whole premise of the study was to determine how social learning works y- yes it was something like that basically they put a bowl of apples on top of a ladder and every time a monkey tried to climb up the ladder to get the apples they would spray all the monkeys with and then after a while so every time another monkey tried it got to a point where if another monkey tried to climb up the ladder the others in the group would try and stop him trying to avoid the getting uh, getting sprayed by water yes and later on in the study 
they slowly introduced new monkeys who did not experience they, this they swapped they swapped the monkeys out one by one one by one and let's call the naive monkey yes um naive meaning he doesn't uneducated. know yeah he's kind of uneducated in in the sense of he did not experience the same experiences the the already established monkeys have yes, experienced he, he doesn't know why they are not allowed to climb onto the ladder but he's still stop he, he's still getting stopped even if he tries so after all they swapped all the other monkeys out they oh after they swapped all the monkeys out none of them have ever been sprayed with water but all of them knew that you're not supposed to climb up on the ladder yes and kind of like the the takeaway you can get from from that in a sense is you know that idea of it's always been been this way you know generations teach each other they don't necessarily need to experience the same ex- experiences but it's that social learning so that's actually a very interesting study of oh, this just reiterates that we teach our generation to be better than us my dad always says it's much less expensive to learn from other people's mistakes than you making those mistakes yourself so why don't some horses not seem to get along that's a very good question and something we hear a lot is and this is something i hear a lot on on tiktok is that my horse doesn't like other horses or my horse hates turnout a study conducted by you this is a big one mies fjord jorgensen 2009 i hope i said that i would give you a solid 9 out of 10 really that. yes thank you so the study showed results that gives a possible explanation of why aggression may occur within social groups the initial aim of the experiment was to test the effects of such gender separation on injuries social interactions and individual distance in domestic horses they found that early social experience of horses management of feeding and space allowance probably represents more important factors for successful group housing of domestic horses so we can conclude that it is a environmental issue being a lack of resources like food and space and not a quote unquote social issue or that we are dealing with quote unquote antisocial horses horses that just seem to go against their biological nature of being a social animal and just something from my own experience is that some horses have not been taught by other horses just to be clear other horses not us to interact appropriately with other horses for these exact reasons Once again I would go as far as to say this is a disease of domestication also aggression and acting out aggressively towards other horses is something very seldom seen in a f- in feral horse groups because acting out aggressively can cause injury injury means a high likelihood of death because you're the slowest horse in the group so predators are can e- more easily pick you off and aggression causes disrupts the harmony within a band and it's so important for horses to be syn- synchronized to avoid danger but once again this is a topic for another podcast because there's a lot that goes into social structures and the importance of social structures but in short i want to just mention that aggression occurs in two instances it occurs in in feral groups I, i would like to add is when horses want to create space between one another when they are running for example and to evade inappropriate courtships that's according to lucy reese and the hours and hours and years and years and years and years and years of studying she did those are the only concrete instances when ho- feral horses will act aggressively towards one another and and it makes sense but just to go back a bit why wouldn't horses like turn out 
Why would they rather go back into a tiny stall all alone? This is a bit of a complicated topic, but I will link a podcast episode from Adele Shaw from The Willing Equine. This wouldn't be an Empowering Equine podcast episode if I don't mention Adele. Yes, big fans, big fans. Big fans, big fans. The podcast goes into a lot of detail on specifically this. Why do some horses seemingly not enjoy turnout? And how to help horses adjust to being turned out. It's episode 52, titled Helping Horses Adjust to Turnout. But in short and oversimplified, the horse is overwhelmed. It's often horses that have been denied turnout for so long and suddenly is overstimulated by being turned out that they just act quote-unquote crazy. And another element to that can be separation anxiety when turned out alone or the horse or their friend is taken away. So those all have a factor, but I highly recommend listening to Adele's podcast. My horses now live out 24-7 in their fixed group and... I would say I'm pretty passionate about this because there was a time in my life when I thought it was okay to keep horses stalled and isolated and I was in an industry where, you know, nobody even questioned this and it's absolutely ridiculous. There were little things like some barns had open stalls where horses were able to see each other through the bars and sniff each other but based on my standards now and based on all the research that has been done this isn't enough this isn't welfare and I 100% understand that not everyone can provide their horses with thousands of hectares of turnout space I wish I could but unfortunately I can't we do, we do the best we can with what we have available. But going back to the way beginning of our discussion, a professional show jumper that can afford a horse treadmill. You need to fact check me. I don't know how much those things cost, but I mean, it's, I'm guessing it's much cheaper or much, more, sorry, not cheaper. It's much more expensive than the average human treadmill. I'm 99% sure they are able to afford space for paddocks or fields. And I also understand that due to medical reasons, horses need to go into stall rest, etc. I'm not talking about those instances. I'm talking about individuals who have all the resources and funding to be able to provide their horses with these basic needs and enough to give it an access but chooses not to for what for convenience i don't know sorry i got a bit heated there this is not a hate podcast (laughs) so that's my take on the topic at the end of the day we all want the best for our horses because we all love these amazing creatures Little turnout is better than no turnout at all. So we take baby steps. Hope today's discussion was enlightening and gave some food for thought. If you don't mind, give us a review. If you have any suggestions or questions, you are more than welcome to send me a DM on Instagram at Empowering Equine. I will link that down down below in my link tree. I now have a link tree, guys. I feel so so professional. Give all my links in one place. The husband, do you want to say a last word? Because my brain is fried and my throat is so sore. Yes. No. I think that's all from us. I I don't think we have anything to add that onto that. Yes. So that's all from us. Be kind to one another. Hug your horses. Hug your horses. Until next time. Until next time.